Sir Stephen Wilkinson, thank you for accepting my invitation to my series, Asking the Hard Questions. And the question really that I have this time around is what do we mean when we speak of human capital? And how has that meaning shifted in the modern day workplace? So this is the first recording of 2022. And my thrust really is realization of potential. So your unique combination of international experience across the worlds of finance and business, together with your belief in the infinite potential of the small to medium business owner and his enterprise, and your passion for literature and poetry, it offers somebody like me a wonderful uh, opportunity to hear from another viewing things to this sort of mix of limbs. Uh, specifically, I want to ask you in terms of human potential and what it means to be human in the modern day workplace. So I suppose by way of introduction, just very briefly, and I, I couldn't get it all in really in this short period, but you're founder of Good and Prosper, moderator of the podcast, Good and Prosper, and founder of the Internet Publishing House by the same name. Yeah. Uh, you're co-founder of Small Giants Community, a US-based endeavor, which attracts me in terms of your absolute confidence in the potential of small to medium enterprise to even outstrip larger enterprises if run well. If you, if you like, Small Giants is quite a good place to start our mm -hmm. conversation um, because not only was the way that I, that I came into contact with the people who ended up founding the community important but the time in my life that it happened mm -hmm. as well um and i came i came to the small giants mindset or ethos through the book written by the um long time senior editor of ink magazine which is an entrepreneurial magazine in the united states um sure. been around for the last 50 years he was one of the first members of staff. Their staff journalist worked his way up to be editor, was edited the magazine for, for a number of years. Um, highly qualified. It's a great storyteller. It's a delightful human being um, and has accompanied the sort of progress of entrepreneurship and its changing cultural importance in america and therefore in the world of business um over the last 50 years and mm -hmm. he wrote a book in 2005 came out in early january 2006 and mm -hmm. i'd read about the book i think in november of december in 2005 mm -hmm. while i was still running a business in germany that was a finance business and it was very focused on sort of scalable investments in um in all sorts of different types of financing mezzanine financing and equity financing mm -hmm. for medium-sized businesses some small but mostly medium-sized so it was a very sort of model driven business um in 2005 and beginning of 2006 and i read small giants and you know how it is with some books you read them and there's a resonance yeah that yeah. just yeah fills you sure and i ha i have no formal management training mm -hmm. at all so you know as as with many people in business i'm sort of making it up as i go along and hoping through serendipitous um meetings with inspiring individuals and reading good books whether they be biographies or how-to books to somehow fill that void of incompetence with something approaching a system through which you can steer the energy that you've released in your business which we call growth sure. um, and hope that you don't drive it too fast off the cliff or against a wall you have the wonderful backdrop though of years in in the with merrill lynch and as an asset manager in germany well yes and uh, yes and no because it if you come up from the i'm going to call it from the buy side from finance yes you you do have a very 
skewed view of how business works. But let me come back to small giants, otherwise I'll go down that rabbit, that rabbit hole, and I don't want to do that quite yet. Um, yes. okay. You and I, you and I have a history of going down <laughs> rabbit holes. You could talk for hours. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So the small giants. I read the book. I was captivated by it. It filled me with a, I'm going, I'm going to use the word longing, a longing to run a business like that. And like that means a business in which the culture and intimacy of the relationships is at the center of the business priority. The, if you like, the, the, the dynamic organism, the system, Mm -hmm. I hesitate to use the word machine because it isn't. It's a dynamic, biodynamic social system. Right. And whatever you put in the middle of it determines the priorities of everything else. So what appealed to me deeply about the um, small giant's way of doing things, and the book is basically an exploration of 15, 16 different companies of varying sizes who Bo refers to as as choosing human scale sure. over capital scale. So right. instead of getting as big as possible, as fast as possible, they were focusing on something else. And that something else was, and he uses the word intimacy mm -hmm. as, as a descriptor of, of what it is that makes them so special. There is an intimacy in the human relationships that form the core of the social system that is the business and that mm -hmm. extends to suppliers and customers and of course the team members and the people who and the the geographic location in which the company happens to be um, situated and would so, you consider that maybe that was the catalyst for you moving in the direction you've taken oh absolutely there's no there's there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that that mm -hmm. came to me at a time when i was deeply unhappy in my own company um, it was two years before the crash. In fact, it was a year and a half before the crash. And I had surrounded myself almost unwittingly with partners who, when push came to shove, were not really aligned with the way that I wanted to do business. Although, having you know, to be fair to them and to me, I don't think I had the maturity at the stage when I was forming the partnership and the business to really know what it was that I definitively wanted. I just thought we wanted to be successful and get it as large as possible. Um, yeah. And and you know and and if okay. that's your if if that's your only criteria, well, pretty much anybody's good enough who says, yeah, I can do that. In scripting a story, though, as a leader, you have to be open to move with the flow, don't you? What does that mean? You have to be open to moving with the, the story you're writing in creating something and bringing your people with you. You talk about servant leadership, you know? Indeed. Well, you know, pr prior, to, prior to my reading The Small Giants and then getting to know, firstly, Bo and then the friends of Bo Burlingham, who eventually came together to form The Small Giants, community and then the people who were attracted to that who were if you like new to the concept and with whom over the last 14 years we have grown the small giants community into what it is today um and and that has very very little to do with with me and a lot to do with with the, the team in um, currently in detroit and in california who, who actually manage the small giants um but i've been an avid supporter Mm -hmm. and an active participant and I have but I've taken much much more out of the organization and the relationships than than I think I've been able to give and most of that taking has been the taking of inspiration and the taking of operational knowledge how to build a human scale business that genuinely recognizes the potential of the people in it and mm -hmm. exists primarily to enhance the benefit of the community without for one second sacrificing its financial performance. In fact, quite the opposite. What we found is that over time, the returns to culture are, you know, who'd have thought it, um, yes. having 
happy, dedicated, autonomous, thinking people in your organization who are respected and enjoy coming to work, who'd have guessed that they actually produce better results than people who are miserable and can't wait for it to be Thursday because Friday doesn't count (laughs) and Monday I'm still too tired. So there, there is, if you compare the small giants type company to the average in the Gallup um, employee satisfaction survey, which is a, one of the most yeah. useful mm-hmm. measures of where we are, you, know, you will see that the number of people who are actively disengaged you know, yeah. from, from feeling miserable to actively sabotaging the work environment in which they are mm-hmm. has, is about twice the mm-hmm. number of people at the other end who are actively engaged and enthusiastic. And, and there's some and, figure like maybe two-thirds two-thirds versus one-third in terms of engagement one-third oh no the the engagement the engagement i mean they they have three categories they have the highly engaged they have sort of the middle neither very engaged nor very disengaged and then they have the disengaged Mm -hmm. and the bulk i think i think it's about 17 18 percent who are actively engaged and i think it's about 25 to 30 percent it sort of moves Mm -hmm. um who are actively disengaged and then the rest is made up of that amorphous mass in the middle some of whom will be more engaged and some of whom will be less engaged so i, I would probably guess that you're that you are over representing the truly engaged i would guess it's about a quarter max and the rest being on a scale of extremely disengaged to vaguely disengaged wow and then obviously that would have fed into your interest your involvement in the Ryan Business Academy mentoring for growth all of that well I, I, um, the, the the gentleman um who Joe Hogan who who started that concept of mm-hmm. providing experienced business business practitioners as short term mentors for high growth business developers coming through the Ryan Business Academy um, that that's a format we meet once a month and he calls that green jersey work so we do that for free and we we're doing it for the entrepreneurial to 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 put some fertilizer back into the entrepreneurial culture of of Ireland Um, I don't say putting something back putting something back means that you've You've taken too much. <laughs> you've, you've taken too much. Um, yes. And I no, it's to it's to support the ecosystem in which we all thrive. Right. Right. Okay. Um, it's a form of, if you like, experiential tithing. And would you say at this point in your career and in your life, you're doing it your way, as opposed to having to be? Uh, in in a straitjacket in a system that perhaps you might not necessarily have. Well, I've I've always joked with my family that I am that I am um, genetically unemployable. So, <laughs> I so the entrepreneurial route of doing things my way has been really the only one that I've ever considered. I was not really very good as an employee. Um, well, compliance and, and uh, not asking the, the the hard questions was never your thing. No, it wasn't. Mm. No, it wasn't. And and I had this yearning from a very early age of wanting to run my own balance sheet. I just okay. I just wanted my own balance. I just wanted it. I, I didn't want. I wanted to make my own decisions, and I wanted to see the financial effect of my own actions my the manifestation of my own life energy showing itself in this financial statement and i've i've always had this deep understanding of what a balance sheet is i've, I've just got it from a very early age and it's through my work now with thc consult total human capital i have come across quite a few clients who've decided you as a result of this period of reflection during COVID and COVID lockdowns, that they've decided, no, I want to do it my way. And they have actually left what would be considered good paying jobs 
predictable salaries, security to run their own businesses, which has been a real leap of faith, you know? Huge. Yeah. Well, and, and, and many people, I would suspect, possibly everybody who gets into business really doesn't know what they're letting themselves in for because yeah, there's, you, a certain, you, there's a certain thrill in it though isn't there there's a certain giddy uh, thrill at the notion of i may make it big there's there's this promise the whole time there's a renewed promise i i, I, I think that may be there for the first week <laughs> <laughs> and after week one it's christ i hope i don't lose all my money <laughs> I know, I know. Depends on the character. It depends on the character, you know, and the resilience and the the the, the, the personality, etc. Well, if you're not thinking that, then God help everybody else around yeah, you. Because... So you speak, and you know, just to, to 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 break the ice a little, you speak of the journey of the SME owner from doer to investor, at uh, the point of which the entrepreneur can step back and view himself or herself as steward of the capital that the business generates. Now, in your work at the, in, at the present day, working with your, your clients, is that a difficult transition for some business owners, business founders? I would say it's the most difficult transition. Right. Why? Because um, you, you talk about doing things my way. Mm -hmm. Well, small businesses are sort of mini dictatorships. They... And, and they're very, very closely tied to the personality of the, the, uh, the, of the owner themselves. And it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like the relationship between a mother and a child. Um, you know, for the longest time, or well, it's gestating, mm -hmm. the child is a physical extension of the of the mother oh, yeah it's 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 it grows within it mm -hmm. um and is dependent entirely on it and even after birth there is this you know strong sense of of belongingness and oneness with the mother well business owners business owners are very much the same with their businesses and you know, they become a part of them and that's fine but there has to come a stage when the character of the of the business and its ability to to survive as an independent social entity sure. a living thing has to be separated from the actual. from from the actual oh. owner themselves and mm -hmm. i think that the job is to to find and it, this is not a question of growth this is a question of maturity mm -hmm. of of replacing of being replaceable doesn't mean you have to replace yourself but of mm -hmm. being replaceable and having a business that fully respects and is able to pay for the three very distinct roles or the, let's say the two very distinct roles that every owner manager has so in other words the business has to pay for the real work that the owner is doing often you will find owners are doing two to three jobs sure so they're doing all of the sales they're doing you know a lot of the admin and they're doing other jobs yeah. as well part operational part financial if they were you were to take them out you would not be able to find Replace people them. to do a you would never be able to find anybody to do that one job mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you'd have to find maybe two two and a half three mm -hmm. at which point if the business can't afford to buy or pay for those three distinct jobs what the business owner is effectively doing is subsidizing the business with his own labor sure. so mm -hmm. labor needs to be fairly paid for mm -hmm. number one and number two the business also needs to be making a return on the capital investment that the business owner has made. So most business people start the business with whatever capital they can get together, whether that's a thousand euros or 10,000, whatever it is that they need. And nobody will give you them any money except them. 
So they they dive into savings or borrowings or credit card or something because there is nobody who believes in them the way that they believe in them. In that second, the moment that you take one euro of your savings to invest in yourself, even if it's only using your savings to draw down instead of a salary while the business is being built up, you are actually fulfilling two roles. The, The first role is the investor because you as the owner of your savings are having a conversation with you as the entrepreneur and you are persuading yourself that this is a really good investment. Good risk to take, yeah. It's a good risk to take. Mm -hmm. And and of course, because you are the easiest person to fool, you say, oh, sure, look it, take it. On your own side. It'll be fine. (laughs) And, but what, what you fail to do at that point is you you fail to make the distinction between that investment yeah. and your own it's job. So too much every, emotion involved. So, so every time the business the business comes up against a crunch, mm-hmm. you know, on let's say it's it's payroll day on Monday. Mm-hmm you don't know what to do on Friday because you don't have the money there. Over the weekend, you have a series of discussions with yourself and then, surprise, surprise, the negotiation with your investor says, I'm going to sell my watch or I'm going to ask my wife or I'm going to go to my parents or I'm going to mortgage the house. I'm going to do something because you're such an easy touch. You you know, and... What I try to teach entrepreneurs is to recognize and at least give some space to the role of the investor that you also have because let's say the minimum that you, the minimum is 1%. 1% of all your time, just be the investor. Well, what does 1% mean? In a year of 365 days, let's round it up to 400. That's one day a quarter. Mm-hmm. And that'd be four, four days a year that you, so that's one day a quarter. All right. What you should be doing is taking one day every quarter in which you have absolutely no operational responsibilities whatsoever. And you do what an investor would do on that day, which is to review the capital that you've invested to see how well the business is performing, mm-hmm. to review the strategy to have a good look at the quality of the people who are running the business, Mm -hmm. to do some high level thinking around the marketplace, the offering, the the margin structure. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of that requires financial intelligence. You have to be financially fluent. You have to look at the balance sheet. You have to start thinking about intrinsic value. And if you do that once every quarter for one whole day, you know, an investor, what would an investor do? An investor would insist on having reports mm-hmm. that they could read through and ask questions yeah. on a few days before that meeting. They would want one or two people to be on call so that they could answer those questions during the investor presentation. And so you would have to try and, even in your own little business, try and replicate that. Sure. Maybe you would have an advisor with you who would be asking hard questions. And because the person you're asking most of the hard questions about, about is you. Yeah. It's, <laughs> that far makes, it, it, it's far easier to avoid it. But if you, are, if you don't give the investor the respect that he deserves, then you will find that the time when the investor starts getting nasty and demanding returns is exactly the time when, you, when the business is in crisis and it's too late. Sure. Do you find that young entrepreneurs are easier to work with in terms of making that transition? No, I don't. No. Absolutely not. They, they lack experience? They lack... No, you need, to have been, you, you need to have been round the track once and fallen sure. on your face once you in order to, to appreciate. I mean, th- there is a reason that, that we talk of both men and women, but mostly men going through a midlife crisis, and that is that your youthful energy that and your personality structure takes you to you maximize what your personality structure is capable of with your youthful energy up until your mid-30s. 
at the point of your mid thirties, you reach a cusp. Mm -hmm. And then what, what made you successful starts making you unsuccessful because it doesn't work forever. Mm -hmm. And it certainly doesn't work. Once you start taking it off the high octane, I can do anything testosterone fueled youthful phase. That is why men particularly from 40 onwards start having huge issues with their own with the with, with the things that they thought were certain because what used to work doesn't seem to work anymore in fact mm -hmm. it's working against them and that of course is the invitation to maturity to sure. to 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 evolve out of the sort of strictures of your original personality structure. And it's one of the reasons that I spent such a long time studying the Enneagram because the Enneagram is the only sort of personality typology system that allows for dynamic evolution of the personality. You know, it says, it doesn't say you are A, B, C or three or four letters and that's you and live in your box. The Enneagram says we are all on a journey and crises are an invitation to, to mature out of those, that sort of very narrow confine of the personality that you, were, that you grew mm -hmm. up with. Um, and I find to answer your question that the very best people to work with are either women who have a much more intuitive and, um, and less egotistical grip on their personality structure or men who have been through a crisis and have learned from it yeah and are on the in and and have recognized that they need to evolve and, and those you know <laughs> that <laughs> covers quite a large number of entrepreneurs i know but i i definitely young entrepreneurs they don't need the sort of advice that i can give often there are some very reflective young entrepreneurs. There's no doubt about it, but um, the, mostly, the, mostly the, the yeah. yeah. So, and, in, and the more and the more venture capital finance they are, by the way, the yes. less um, the less I have to say to them. Right. Because, at, but actually, the more they'd need somebody like me, because with venture capital, you are playing with people who are very, very financially fluent. They understand, they understand your business far better than and you, you understand. And what they definitely understand is your runway better than you understand it. Mm -hmm. So they understand what's going to happen when you start running out of money in a year and a half's time. So they're, they're more strategic, yeah, yeah. Much, much more. And if you're sitting down at a table as a enthusiastic tech entrepreneur, and you are taking you are taking capital from money people well then you better be really really sh certain of the game that you're playing because it's probably not the game you think it is yeah okay so in, in looking at the term human capital per se yep. you know, it has connotations of hard and soft skills and the the human level interactions and the systems development in response to I suppose, demands as we are on our journey, our economic evolution, etc. Is the human not viewed by the state as capital once he or she is born from the outset? I don't think the state is capable of thinking in terms of capital. It certainly doesn't ever act like it. I mean, capital is something that you build deliberately. It's something that you, that you are that you are aware of, that you, that you look after, you don't deplete it. Um, so I, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think the, the people involved in government have any comprehension of what capital actually is. They may use the word, but they don't know what it means. And in that lack of understanding, is there a, is there a loss to them? Oh, it was huge. I mean, because, because if, you, if, you don't, if you don't understand the, if you don't understand the characteristic of the assets over which you have stewardship for a short period of time, how will you ever know whether your work has been accretive or depletive of those assets? 
Sure. So you 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 miss you miss the the realization of potential. Totally. Well, you don't even think in those terms. Yeah. Yeah. So in the 21st century, we've witnessed the transition from production economy to knowledge economy, and now we're totally enveloped with technology. What are the key assets of the modern day SME in your estimation? And how should we seek to nurture these assets to maximize potential? The ability to create intimacy is, I believe, the key asset, because you can't can't devolve that to a machine mm -hmm. you know i've and been involved i've been involved in the in, in the small business sector and small to medium and there are sort of clear definitions of what that is but let's just say it's businesses between 1 million and 100 million in revenue that would that sort of covers the 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 bulk of it, yeah. the span of the spectrum of things that are potentially SMEs and up to, let's say, 250, 300 employees. The Americans have a slightly different categorization than the Europeans and the Brits, and but it, it's sort of all, it's that end of the market. Mm -hmm. um, I did accounts for something like 96% of all business formations fall into that right. category. That category, yeah. Um, plus the freelancers and the independents and so on. Um, and they account for about 40% of GDP, roughly. And the big ones, the enterprises, they account for about 45% of GDP, maybe 47, that's growing. Mm -hmm. um, so it accounts for an awful lot of employment. It, it accounts for an awful lot of, of individual individual lives and it accounts for a big chunk of of the national product sure so the one thing that every sme can do by choice is to create intimacy and in order to because it is acting at human scale they're all human scale businesses now there is human scale is everybody has the opportunity to know everybody else in the business and and remember their names you know, roughly you're not talking about amorphous departments and and subsidiaries and with people who you've, you, you'll never meet in your life so human scale enterprises have that one enormous advantage of being able to create intimacy and you can only do that if at the same time you are creating all the conditions that um, that make intimacy possible. So there has to be a, a level of security. Mm -hmm. There has to be a level of, of, of safety. There has to be a level of purposefulness. And trust. To know, yeah. And, and trust. And you have to be doing a job that is that is strategically important for your customers. In other words, you have to know what your customers are. So there are, there are a range of business skills, positioning, focusing, strategic direction, financial fluency, and so on, plus the willingness and, and wish of the leaders to actually create an intimate environment um, rather than a, an exploitative one or a a one where people you know don't so care one way. If, if we look at, at the changes wrought by uh, COVID-19 and the change to uh, work practices and this thing of working from home and hybrid hybrid work arrangements etc I argue that there's, a, there's it's, it's very difficult to nurture that type of culture from afar there's a need for the face-to-face -face, there's a need for the interaction now, some American companies that I have dealt with, they have some of their workers, some of their directors have worked for home for the last 15 years and don't see that as a problem at all in terms of the health of the culture of, of an organization. Well, it depends very much on the sort of business. And, you know, I, I, I find it quite difficult to do, to, to create a, a generalization that applies to all businesses. Sure. And it just shows how far away we are from from manufacturing because you can't 
you know, if, if you're in a if you're a manufacturing business, well, you can't work from home. You've got to go to where the machines are. You have to are. be on the floor. Yeah. You have to be on the floor. And if you run a um, retail business, you can't work from home either. So mm. there's a certain arrogance about the way that we talk about you know, the great change. It's only knowledge jobs and sure. and and sort of jobs that can be done by telephone and on a computer that I mean of course there are lots and lots and lots of those and we're moving more towards the service industry but it does but by, by saying we are moving towards this hybrid work environment and of course in certain industries we are definitely and that's probably a good thing mm -hmm. there are swathes of industries who just laugh when you say you know work from home it's or hybrid because it's yeah. just it's just ludicrous but if, let's say are we living through the a uh, period of the human being pitched against the machine i.e technology in many ways and that there's a tug of war going on as such but in actual fact the human's emotional intelligence ability to empathize ability to communicate and and grow relationships etc can never ever be replaced well i'm going to use the swear word because it because i feel like it and it's such bollocks it really is and we've been in this dilemma since the spinning jenny was invented sure and this idea that our technology is somehow vastly superior and different to all the other technologies that have ever come before it is another sign of our historical ignorance and our supreme arrogance that with every advanced civilization now, if you go back and read any any description of an empire in its sort of final millennium or its final century, you will see this extreme confidence in the people running the show that they ha that we have now reached the absolute apogee of civilized advancement and that there is very little that can happen that could possibly top what we've got at the moment. And those sort of that belief system that our, our digital technology, our AI, our understanding of algorithms and laser printing and, and not mm -hmm. laser printing and what's it called, um, 3D printing, that somehow we, we have now reached the very apogee of yeah. what God, even God couldn't have imagined that we would have got so far and done so well. It's complete nonsense absolute so the, rubbish the, the great reset really is um nonsense well uh, no big uh, the great reset i don't even know what that is like I, i'm not quite sure whether that's one of these terms being thrown out in terms of we're, we're at a period we're at a pivotal stage where we, we're ready to reset and approach things differently and i suppose that the human will have a different position really vis-a-vis the the power of technology and without going down the transhuman transhuman route or anything like that there's a, there's a real there's a real struggle the, going on or being the, 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 it, for me i find that all very um amusing because that's not how people work you know, we so it will, it will ultimately fall flat on its face i think it absolutely will and the reason that we're seeing all this at the moment because is if in my humble opinion is because we have run we've lost control of our finances right. we've we are we are more in debt than we've ever been i think in the history of the world other than possibly the weimar republic and zimbabwe and what's the way out what's the way out is there well there is there is only I'm afraid, there is only one way out there's there's one direct way and one indirect way the indirect way is inflation and then a collapse mm -hmm. and the other way is the direct collapse um and the austrian economist particularly ludwig von mises has written quite clearly about this um and in my humble opinion and i could be entirely wrong but we have lost control of money. Money is now no longer really being controlled. The, the machine that they've created, this debt fueled faux pos prosperity, which politician generation of politicians have now sort of kicked this can down the road because they don't really understand what they're doing. They pretend that it's all going to be paid back somehow. 
we now know that it is there is no you know in the last 10 years we've seen the complete um the complete giving up of any pretense that money itself was a store of value which it used to be you know it used so to be able to in heading in heading to collapse then how do you control the masses how in do you control the masses when the collapse happens and uh, i mean how do you control how do, how do we, how do you control how do they propose uh, factoring in the control for the human reaction to this and human survival the way that we've always done it people people will be left to themselves one of our people will will have to rediscover their potential in the sure. capital that they have and in communities yes you know we've one of the one of the one of the great um erosions of the last 200 years has been the erosion of community yeah. and and its replacement by government and, and government interference in every aspect of well it, because That's because once exactly once you that. once you give up your once you give up your communities and yes. i'm talking about communities yeah. there's not not i'm not talking about going back to the village but the association it's social life thrives at its best when there is competition between different communities and those communities themselves form a a structure that allows life to thrive, to thrive. instead of having one overarching monster mm -hmm. community which we call the state that then subsumes all other activities into it and of course it does it just gobbles them up like a great cancerous blob and that's that way lies totalitarianism because people desperately need community and the more we are isolated as individuals the more we 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 look to whatever community is available and you know football clubs do a really good job Good of model. aggregating that sense of community and it's global you know there are manchester united fans in italy and in sure. south america and in australia mm -hmm. and they have something in common they have a they, they, they form a they form a community and they interact and, you, and they you very much the gaa here in ireland absolutely and in yeah. in, in ireland it's the gaa and it's yeah. and it used to be the churches you know mm -hmm. and it um and in certain circumstances it, it still is and they form a Mm -hmm. core communities and then there are business associations and but they are all relatively weak as we have seen in covid with particularly the churches buckling under sure. and and that just giving up coming back to the human capital and to the evolution of the de various de definitions of human capital and we moved from schultz where he he was uh, referred to as all human abilities to i uh, to be either innate or acquired becker then added in the whole notion of knowledge information ideas skills and the health of individuals but more recently in 2013 thomas nudged towards people their performance and their potential in the organization and that's the first time the word potential has been mentioned so there's a future orientation there that has entered the equation now having worked in the worlds of finance business and now with smes how has the definition of capital played out in your experience over the last three decades and is the human being appropriately facilitated in achieving his or her, or her true potential in the workplace? I think probably not. Mm -hmm. In order to realize potential, I think you have, like a business has to do, has to do a number of things correctly. Firstly, it has to have a very strong sense of its own identity, mm -hmm. a business itself. Now we we talk about values, but values are you know you can buy a pack of ten of them and they cost nothing. You can hang hang them up on the wall and they all have the same words: fairness and equity and and respect. And they mean nothing until they're tested. And my own understanding of values is they really only come into their own when they are in conflict. 
because then you have to make substantive decisions and I mean, have a hierarchy stand up, of values. And, 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 and you have to, and you, and you have. And that's how character is formed. So, in order for, in order for a business to be able to to be a place that recognizes and nurtures potential, it has to know who it is itself, because in order to do that is the prerequisite for attracting the right people. If I don't know who I am then pretty much anybody with a pair of hands and a smattering of the language in which I'm operating will do. And that's how a lot of decisions are taken. You know, there's a sort of cursory look at the CV. There is a, um, and there's a higher and higher and pray. Mm -hmm. And, and the system isn't geared to, um, to the medium and long-term development of potential capturing of knowledge the nurturing of culture the and the, the creation of intimacy because so is, is, is that tied up with control or a desire to control i don't think i think it's more a system it's more more emblematic of a lack of control it's it's the it's usually short-term imperatives dictating the pace rather than longer term or even medium term purpose mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and because if i'm constantly just reacting to short-term volatility you're firefighting yeah well then I'm, I'm firefighting all the time mm -hmm. and you know if you ask most small businessmen they will tell you that that's sort of what it feels like if it's not one thing it's another and they really never get the time to sit down and reflect or because the strongest way of building a cohesive team that is capable of operating without the owner coming back to what we were talking about at the beginning sure. is to use your existing well-recruited team to to act as recruiters so if you have a players on your team people who are fully aligned with the business who are enthusiastic about it who have autonomy who are finding that they are being given responsibility to allow them to develop their potential given the training to do it have an understanding of the purpose of the business have a vision with sound finances a a respect for their intelligence that allows them to understand the financial performance of the business at every level if you've got people like that, then they will go out of their way to find similar people who will fit to the business, which gives the small business a huge advantage because it doesn't have any advantage if it's going on on deed and trying to recruit exactly the same way that some that Facebook and Twitter and all the other companies are. So I mean, that you, whole notion of getting the person job fit right and keeping the culture alive when you get it right to make sure that it's not endangered in any way. Yeah, and, and, and culture is deliberate. And there's a, there's a wonderful one of, I, I'm not a great fan of Jim Collins. Um, I, everybody sort of has Jim Collins in their library. And I will admit I have Jim Collins in my library as well, um, because you have to read Jim Collins's books, Good to Great, and in order to know what he's talking about, I have never been a big fan of his. Right because I found his, his universe and definition of success, first time I read it, completely spurious. I understand it from a, from a sort of top-down macro investment perspective, but if anybody's worked in the sort of real world of small to medium-sized businesses, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's not applicable. It's sort of no however, it's no however he, yeah. did, he did write a book or publish a book very recently mm -hmm. called B.E. 2.0 right and be 2.0 stands for beyond entrepreneurship 2.0 right. and it was his first book that he wrote i don't know 30 years ago with his mentor and his mentor died a, f a year or two ago and he decided to rewrite the book and re in a new edition sure. sort of drawing on his 30 years of experience and dedicating it to his mentor it's a beautiful book and he has one section on leadership which is outstanding it really is it's outstanding and he i'm just going to see if i can find it and then i can quote 
He says, most exceptional leaders grow into their capabilities, not because they are trying to be a great leader, but because they're trying to be worthy of the people they lead. That's the servant leadership Very idea. Good. Yes. If you want the people with whom you work to improve their performance, first improve your own. If you want others to expand their capabilities, first expand your own. And that is about as good a, a, as good an instruction manual for what it takes to be a leader. leader leadership is a choice. Yes. And either you make it actively and you lean into it and recognize that your primary job is to improve your own performance, to expand your own capabilities. And, and I think that 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 is at the very, very heart of the of the the DNA or the the secret that turns a small business into a great small business, great business. Right. is right. and and its ability to attract people to be profitable. All of those other business skills is if the leader accepts that challenge. Difficult though it is in a small business because financial the lack of resources the lack of resources is is always an issue yes but that's where i say strategy and financial fluency as long as and and in a, an approach of servant leadership if you can get those three together then that's your your ticket out of groundhog day and so important to get the right leader get the wrong leader they can destroy all before them i mean the the, the vision for a, for an organization does not rise above the vision and the and the, the humility of the leader well visioning is one of the things that i teach mm -hmm. business leaders to do and I have a very specific process that, right. that i lead people through in order to extract that that idea of what success looks and feels like at a very specific point in the future tying that into their to their business model and ensuring that they have a map of the destination that is inspiring strategically sound and shared by the entire organization i believe that to be at the heart of one of the at the heart of the the skill set that a leader needs to have is to be able to articulate that vision but it is the word vision is one of those inflated words that sort of float around the business world that can mean pretty much anything from a big goal mm -hmm. to some sort of woolly aspiration for being market leader or something that it, it I know. a vision for me is something very specific it's a it's a description in detail in narrative prose in the present tense anchored at a very particular moment in time and giving as broad a view of all, all the aspects of the business at that point that the visionary can think of and evolve that's sure. And getting there is, it's really hard work. It's the heart and soul of things, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, it is. It's, it is. It yeah. is. So it, it, just moving it on a little now, I've, I've, I've taken up a lot of your time. Um, Schultz and Nelson looked at human capital as the capacity to adapt in changing environments, in disequilibrium situations. I suppose we could, we could consider this time uh, of uh, strange happenings with COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera, as one of these times. And so their, their ideas play out very much contemporary literature around a uh, human capital. Has that human capital been the differentiator in terms of survival or otherwise for organizations during this COVID-19 period of lockdowns and shifting interpretations of work and workplace, et cetera, et cetera. I, 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 I could give you a snarky answer and say we are permanently, in a sense, all dynamic systems are always on the edge of disequilibrium. Mm -hmm. And because they're dynamic, they, the moment that they tip into a new state of relative volatility, Sure. Their dynamic nature ensures that they come back to some form of, of marginal equilibrium, equilibrium again. So I, sure. I, I, I would argue against that being particularly insightful. However, if, if, it, if what the author is referring to is an ability to adapt, 
quickly to the threat of disequilibrium, mm -hmm. then I would say that that is absolutely the case. And if you saw in Ireland in the, um, in the extremely devastated and hard hit authoritarian shackling of the hospitality industry. Sure, yes. You, right. you, you would see some very creative responses. Absolutely. And, and, and the difference between somebody who says, I'm going to have to shut down because I've got no options no, 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 or a business that says we're going to do home delivery, we're going to buy a truck, we're going to, we, the, the rent that we're saving, we're going to invest yeah. that into something else. We, the, the, this, a bit, this willingness to, to recognize in change what hasn't changed. So, for instance, a restaurant that has built up a reputation and a good customer base, mm -hmm. the only thing that changed in COVID, and it was a big thing, but it was the only thing that really changed was their ability to deliver mm -hmm. in the traditional format. Mm -hmm. They still had their reputation intact. They still had their ability sure. to cook intact. They still, they, they'd just been thrown a significant curveball curve or obstacle mm -hmm. separating them from their customers now the ones that survived and thrived recognized what hadn't changed and adapted their and delivery right. and their ability to interact with their customers accordingly now yeah. that was some time you know that probably meant at a lower level of volume to start with at lower levels of revenue but at least they were thinking it through and adapting and adopting rather than giving up and some possibly yeah, the had to of necessity being the mother of invention it was a great a great saying my father used to use and no doubt about it some people really did themselves proud how they responded yeah they did and 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 you know it takes an awful lot to kill the entrepreneurial drive it sure. really does you know they they've tried their damnedest over the last year and a half um in a way that only people who draw a state pension and state salary could ever do because they just don't know what it they even they can't even comprehend what has to happen in order to pay one person a salary uh, or was wages it, there, there was a little bit of a miss really in not factoring in or not a, a reckoning on the human response because since man was hunter gatherer we always worked towards the notion of survival and it's survival of the fishes and, pe and people are going to survive regardless of what's thrown at them well i think that ties back to your original question about the state and human capital the state doesn't recognize human capital it only sees it only sees masses to manage it wants them in sure. silos That's it wants them true. it wants them in their in in its bureaucratic system yeah. of management it wants to manage it's to herd, people you know. it doesn't want yeah. to develop individual potential because yeah. it can't it has no con it has no concept that would enable it to be specific around the requirements of each individual that's sure. why we have markets and that's why markets work better than bureaucracies Democracy, because yeah. markets are capable of organizing themselves around the smallest individual unit, sure. namely the individual. The individual. Okay. Yeah. So we come to the last notion of living in the VUCA world, that notion of the only certainty in the future being uncertainty, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity and ambiguity. I rather like to turn that on its head. And I ask you, how can we as a species turn the VUCA around to realize our true potential in terms of vision, understanding, care, and action? That's my VUCA. Vision, understanding, care, and action. How can well, we turn it around? Well, it, within, within your framework of vision, understanding, care, and action, it's bracketed by vision on the outside and action on vision and action on the outside and yes. in the middle are understanding and care yeah. right so if you look at that as being you start with where you want to go to stephen covey talks of start with the end in mind sure. that's why the vision is so important because as my grandma said if you don't know where you're going you'll end up somewhere else and vision is vision is a conscious decision as to where you want to be in the future 
Yeah. So that, that gives you your direction. Action is what allows you to, to okay. start making the move towards it. So yeah, yeah. The, the, a, a conscious decision to put your resources into movement towards that preferred future. So those two things are the necessary, are necessary for change, the vision and the action. In the middle is understanding and care. Understanding is something that comes from within us. We have to nurture it and we have to learn it. It's a respect for the other That's and the, an empathy. And EQ. care is the action part of that. Care yeah. is action in, okay, care is understanding in action. It's what we it's what we do to look after each other, ourselves, self-care and care of the others. That feeds into the culture. So within that VUCA, you have your version, the vision, understanding, care and action. You have the brackets of direction and action or movement and inside of the values and the humanity that tells us how we are going to get to that place in the future. So I think you've encapsulated with that a very clear understanding um, or a very clear model puristic of, of what is necessary to achieve potential yeah it's the sandwich effect yeah i i, I like to think in the positive i can, I, I think uh, people can only move forward to achieve or to realize their true potential uh, in the positive mode and uh, with, with a, a reference to potential and that giddiness of a better tomorrow you know well, if if we if we are of you know for people of faith, the there is no question that at the very core of our belief system is the fact that we're made in God's image, and if we're made in God's image, then then we already contain everything within us. We sure. are we are the universe. We, we are, are we are the ultimate. We have ultimate creative potential, sure. and our job is to unleash it. And that can only come through understanding care and in our faith, um, love, love of self and love of each other and love of our world. That's a lovely note to finish on. Thank you. Sir Stephen, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed chatting you and I've enjoyed our conversations to date. And uh, let's continue them. Uh, for the moment, thank you very much. For thank you very much for having me on your show, Teresa. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you. Thank bye. you. Take care. Bye bye.